Can you hear all right in the back? Okay. It's a little bit past 1.30, and we're going to go ahead and get started with our uh, Dairy Forage Seminar Series. But before I do that, I have a couple announcements to make. The first one is that this uh, presentation is being recorded. So if you have a cell phone, please turn it off or turn the ringer down. We would appreciate it. Second thing is you may see some promotional materials around the stage and in this area. As an <clears throat> employee of the federal government, I have to say that no promotional material implies an endorsement by the United States Department of Agriculture. So I, I want to make sure that's clear. All right. <clears throat> we are very pleased today to have uh, Dr. Gonzalo Ferrara, uh, who is here from Virginia Tech. He is an extension uh, dairy specialist in Virginia, and he's going to speak to us today about incorporation of cereal grain forages into rations for lactating cows. So, thank, thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Is is this working? You can hear me. Good. So, good afternoon, everybody. And again, my name is Gonzalo Ferreira, and I have a different accent. I'm from the south, but not Virginia, okay? Even southern. Uh, I'm from Argentina, so <laughs> allow me to be patient with my accent, okay? We, I was invited, and I thank for that, uh, by Dr. Koblenz to talk about the incorporation of cereal grain uh, forages into rations, and mainly I'm going to talk about the silages, okay, of these forages. As Dr. Colin said, I also have my disclaimer, mention of any commercial services or products, which I will mention, does not imply either recommendation or endorsement. So, having said that, one of the typical questions I receive is, what is the best silage? What is the best forage? Okay? And I don't know, we have different perspectives and we can answer that in different ways. Some people like to have more protein, some people like, the, they like to have more energy in that, in that forage. For me, this is my own definition of the best forage or the best silage is the one that allow me, allows me to formulate the cheapest diet possible while I'm covering the requirements of the dairy cow, okay? So you will see that my talk is going to spin around that concept most of the time. But before that, we are here under the context of the uh, forage Super Bowl and I imagine everybody wants to talk about forage quality, okay? So we will start talking a little about the what. What forages, what species are we going to, to grow? And for that, I'm using a database that I obtained from a commercial uh, laboratory, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services. And they provided me a very strong database in which I ended up using 36 more than 36,000 data, okay? Uh, sample uh, forage analysis. This database had data from July 2017 to June 2019, so two years of analysis for these forages. Again, I focus on the silages, but for that, I had to do some assumptions, okay? These were the two main ones. Typically, there was a big name that was Treaty kale uh, forage or rye forage. It didn't say hay or silage or pasture, okay? So I had to do some kind of cleaning of the database in that case. And if the forage had more than 80% dry matter, I assume it was a hay. If it had less than 18% dry matter, I assume it was a pasture, okay? And from there, we st I started uh, working on the data. Now, you have a data set and you will have different values. Look, think about them from high to low. And we are going to use a lot of box plots. I don't know if you know what are the box plots. That is a statistical tool. So I will try to explain what is that. So we have a bunch of data. Well, in this box, we are going to have half of the data, okay? 
Then, so in, in, in this median, this line here in the middle, that separates half of the data above, half of the data below. Then we have a Q1, quartile one, and that means that 25% of the data is below that value. Then we have a Q3, that means that 25% of the data is above that value, okay? Then we have a range between the Q3 and the Q1, and we call that interquartile range. And if you do 1.5 times the IQR from Q3, you have the maximum value, theoretically. And if you do on the other way, 1.5 times the interquartile range, you have a minimum value. That is that pretty much most of the data should lie somewhere there. And sometimes you had what we call outliers, which that means data that is out of the range. Why did I take this time? It's because I'm going to show a lot of these box plots that hopefully you can follow me. Just as a warm up, here we have four different uh, cereal grains, barley, oat, rye, triticale, and wheat. And I'm going to keep these five species all the time. Here we have the dry, on the y-axis, the dry matter concentration. And this means that pretty much most of, the, of these silages, the dry matter concentration for all species is between 29% and let's say in this case, 41% dry matter. Obviously, there is a lot of data above that. But half of them, of the, all the samples, again, 36,000 samples, are between 30 and 40% dry matter. Dry matter so far doesn't tell you much, but we will start looking to the different uh, nutrients or composition entities of the forages. In this case, we have crude protein, and you can see here on the y-axis, pretty much the, how high is that box is telling you typically where is the protein of these forages. We can see, for example, that rye, typically compared to the other species, tend to have the greatest crude protein concentration compared to the other species. In the case of barley, typically it's going to be a lower concentration. To give you some perspective, this is about 6,000 samples, 6,000 samples, 9,000 samples, 9,000 samples, 6,000 samples. So there is a lot of information. That this is what we are doing so far regarding forage quality, crude protein. One thing is so far from here, if you want to get some crude protein, maybe it's going to be easier on the hand of ryegrass. Uh, rye, not ryegrass, rye. And obviously, as you can see, it's very atypical to obtain from these forages crude protein concentrations high enough as, for example, alfalfa haylage, okay? Now we are going to look to the NDF or the fiber concentration of these forages on the y-axis. And as we can see here, pretty much the fiber concentration is going to be typically above 50% of the dry matter, okay? One first conclusion about this. These forages, these silages, typically you cannot compare them to typical values of corn silage. So we are talking about two different things here, okay? You might have some similar values in the case of the barley, we will see later because of the grain, but typically speaking, you will not have the fiber concentrations that you typically obtain in the corn silage. This slide, in this case, we have NDF digestibility or fiber digestibility. And one interesting observation here is uh, that both rye and triticale typically are having the greatest fiber digestibilities relative to wheat, oat, and barley so far. This to me was kind of a surprise somehow, but this is the reality. And then when we see look into the quality of the fiber. What I did here is, I don't know if like in today's presentation in the morning, they talk about lignin. Lignin is what drives much of the digestibility of the fiber. So here what I plotted is the lignin concentration in that fiber, okay? 
and see how was the relationship with NDF digestibility. Obviously, there is a negative relationship between NDF digestibility and lignin concentration, but the important thing is that pretty much all species, they had the same line. So there is not a species uh, variation there. Pretty much lignin apparently is affecting the digestibility in the same way. And finally, here we have the starch concentration of these silages. And as I told you, in the case of the barley, are, is the species that has the greatest concentration of starch relative to the other species. And try uh, rye and triticale, maybe they have the lowest concentration of starch. Therefore, they're going to have the lowest concentration of energy. How are we doing so far with the accent? Can you follow me? Good. So, another thing about these silages, uh, as a dairy nutritionist, I, I, I use a lot of these uh, small grain silages, particularly in the close-up pen, okay? And maybe after looking at this data, I can say that I was maybe lucky somehow. Why did I do that? Because you have a high fiber concentration with a very decent NDF digestibility, so it's a good way for working on that transition curve. Well, in this case, what I did is I put the potassium data, and I don't know if you know, but potassium can be a challenge if it is too high to have a, a negative decad of the diet, and therefore, uh, if you have too, too, too high potassium, con potassium concentration, that could be a, a challenge for that transition curve study, uh, trans transition curve. So, you can see that rye and triticale, pretty much they have potassium concentrations above 3%. That is on the very high side. And maybe if you are thinking on this forage for close-up uh, cows, maybe barley would be a better choice in that case. So partial conclusions right now, rye and triticale, they have the greatest crude protein concentration, that is a positive. They have the greatest NDF digestibility, that is a positive. The lowest UNDF, undigested NDA fiber, that is a positive too. Um, they're going to have the lowest starch, which you can consider that as a negative value uh, response. And then the greatest uh, potassium, which that would be a negative. About lignin, there are not differences among the different uh, species. So, so far here, I wanted to talk about the what to, the different species. Now we're going to talk a little about the when to harvest and why, okay? And for that, I'm going, first of all, I'd like to talk about the, to see the big picture. It's not just a matter of nutrition. I think we have to see the whole rotation uh, of the system. In, in the in the when we make these choices, this is a picture I took a few years ago from Argentina, uh, in which we were having a very bad drought. As you can see there, the corn after ryegrass in this case, the the moisture of the soil was depleted because of that ryegrass. So you have to see the whole thing. We are in Wisconsin, again, it's very different than Virginia. The window for doing this double cropping is totally different. So again, I'm not a a great fan of double cropping. I think you have to consider this with your agronomist, with your nutritionist, and go from there. So don't, don't lose sight on the, on the rotation. Again, we are going to talk, we are talking here about forage quality, and we are looking to the same species in this case, but looking to different moments. And for this, I'm using a data set, very nice paper published by Dr. Koblenz last year. Uh, in which they harvested triticale at different maturity stages. And you will see a set of figures showing here we have growth stage, and that would be similar to maturity. That means on this side we have more mature forages, on the left side we have less mature. And they harvested these forages at different time points. But I'm going to stress mainly the two typical ones, which are the boot stage and the soft dough stage, which is here, okay? Obviously, when you wait more time to harvest your forage, the good thing is that you're going to have more yield, okay? And that 
is going to end up in a cheaper uh, cheaper silage, dollars per ton of dry matter. What happens to the fiber concentration or the energy concentration if you want? Here we have NDF concentration and maturity and we can see that as the, ma as the plant matures the concentration of NDF goes up, that is typical of, of pastures, but then it starts to go down. Why is it going down? Because we have some grain in that plant that is accumulating the starch and that is diluting that fiber, okay? But if we see the lignin on a cell wall basis, if we take only the fiber, we can see that the lignin is going up and up and up regardless of that starch, okay? So we harvest at wood stage, we're going to have less lignin in that cell wall. If we harvest on the uh, soft dough stage, we are going to have much more lignin in that cell wall. What happens to the digestion rates uh, of these forages when we harvest them at boot stage or sub dow stage. In that paper very nicely they have the kinetics uh, parameters and this is the time of fermentation in the, in this case was in vitro and here they put how much of that NDF disappeared, how much was digested. So if we harvest at boot stage it, they, they harvested that boot stage and the NDF disappearance was 76%, but when they harvested at a soft dough stage, that fiber only 38% disappeared, okay? So obviously you're going to have a much lower NDF digestibility with the soft dough. Partial conclusion so far, boot stage, you're going to have less yield, that is a bad one but you're going to have more crude protein. You are going to have greater NDF, very likely. Is that good or bad? Usually I respond that it depends on what you need that forage for, okay? Could be good, could be bad. Least lignification of the cell wall, that is very good, and therefore you're going to have greater NDF digestibility. So, so far I have talked about forage quality and just that. One thing that I like is to put forage quality in the context of economics. Okay, remember what my definition of the best silage, the one that I can formulate the cheapest diet possible while I'm covering the requirements of the cow. The other definition that I usually say is the, the one that I can grow uh, or obtain according to my environment. Okay, if I'm in, I don't know, in, in Nevada, Maybe my chances of getting silages are, are different than in, in the Midwest. So for, did, for this, what I did is I, I took some, some information from Dr. Koblen's paper, and I put different scenarios, two tons of dry matcha per acre, four tons of dry matcha per acre, six tons of dry matcha per acre. You will tell me, hey, two tons is too low. Well, but many of the extension publications that I crossed are here. Some of them are here. A few of them are in the six tons. Okay? Yeah, so you can take whatever you want. So I put an $80 per acre for spreading manure, $19 for weed control, and that includes the spraying and the product. Then we do a no-till planting with uh, included the seed of the treaty gel at $55 per ton. Uh, six months because I'm using the land only for a few months for this crop of uh, $35 per, per acre and again that is maybe some values for Virginia not for here I put an interest rate and then the variable cost which would be the chopping, holding and siling, the inoculant given here at the end the total cost in dollars per acre and here is the, to the proportional after harvesting, I put a 10% shrinkage. Could be more, could be less. You will, you will define that. Here we have our final silage cost. If we have a yield of two tons per acre, it's going to be $54. If we have four tons per acre, it's going to be $33. If it is six tons, $25, okay? So obviously, more yield, cheaper silage. 
So then what I did is, okay, we have these two silages, and I picked the two tons and the four tons. And I said, okay, let's plan four, eight different scenarios. Let's say that we have a, we are harvesting at boot stage, or we are having a harvesting at soft dough stage. Let's say we are in a high grain prices context, or we are in a low grain price context. Let's say we, as a nutritionist, we like to feed high forage diets, or we like to feed low forage diets. And here we have all the combinations, all the eight different scenarios. Low prices, high forage, low forage, high prices, high forage, low forage, and then the boot stage or the soft dough. Then what I did is, this is a database with all the prices, uh, some of the prices of the commodities. We have, in this case, soybean meal, and this is, you cannot see this here, but it starts in 1981, up to, uh, I think this was up to last month, okay? So we have 40 years of data here. Now, as you can see, there is, a, uh, n there is variation here, 20 years ago, but not as much as in the last 20 years. So I decided arbitrarily, I said, okay, I'm not interested in this part of the database, I will use the, the noisy one. So what I did is I put the prices of the commodities that were available in the database. This is a database from USDA. And I had prices for corn, for soybean meal, for hay, alfalfa hay, corn gluten feed, gl corn gluten meal, cotton seed, uh, yes, cotton seed meal, and urea, okay? And I had a lot of data, so I did a box plot, and I said, okay, I will, took, I will take the, the third quartile and the first quartile as the high price and the low price. One thing that I did then is I added a hauling fee to that ton of commodity, and here are the prices that I end up using. For example, alfalfa hay from $195 to $119. Corn grain, a high price of 161, these are dollars per ton, uh, $95 per ton as a low price. I did this uh, at the end of August this year. As you can see, we, are, we were at that time right in between the high and the low prices. To give you some perspective. So then, having the prices, what I did is, okay, I went to the uh, Russian formulation software, in this case I used AMTS, and I did an optimization uh, Russian formulation based on least cost, and these are some, most of the constraints that I use. First of all, I, I wanted to include either 40 or 60% forage in the diet, I wanted, I wanted at least 100% of the requirement of energy, no more than 110. The same for uh, metabolizable protein. Uh, I wanted at least 100% or 110. No more than 70% crude protein. NDF to be between 28 and 32. Uh, less than 42% uh, non fiber carbohydrates and less than 6% fat. And here we have a summary of what I obtained. Here we have the low prices scenario, the first four, the high prices scenario. Then we have the four, uh, high forage diet, low forage diet, high forage diet, low forage diet, boot stage, soft dough, and so on. So first of all, in the low price scenario with high forage diet at the boot stage, a feed cost of 3.13. One thing I said right now is, before you jump into my jugular vein, is that uh, 313 I know is cheap, but this doesn't include the mineral mix and many of the additives, okay? Um, when I include in the diet the silage at the soft dough harvesting time, first of all, I didn't arrive to a, a solution, but it was pretty close and I obtained a diet with a little cheaper. Same with the low uh, forage scenario with the um, boot stage and with the soft dough. And then we will see in detail what happened. 
So here we have the diet with the low price scenario, high forage, boot stage. And you can see here all the results of the diet, of the ration. And everything was according to what I, I, I programmed the software to, to, to result, how I wanted the diet. 24 kilograms of dry matter, that would be similar to 52 pounds of dry matter. That is what I wanted to feed to the cow. So this is pretty much what I wanted. And you can see in this case, it's including triticale at boot stage, corn silage, pretty much half and half, ground corn grain, soybean meal, and corn gluten feed. So far, everything looks fine. Now, when I include uh, the soft dough silage, which is here, the triticale, you can see that in this case, we have less um, triticale silage, less corn silage, and we have a new ingredient, which is alfalfa hay. Now, this diet ended up being cheaper than the previous one, but has another ingredient that we need to manage which is not that easy to manage, which is the alfalfa hay. We need to, to chop that one and we need to add it. That cost of chopping is not included there. So it's a little more complex. On the other side, you can see that there are a few parameters that they were not in line with what I wanted, but they were close enough. In the case of the low price scenario, with the low forage diet in this case, at the boot stage, Pretty much the, the Russian formulation software is including most, all of the, of the forage as the triticale silage. There is no more corn silage. So the question is, do we really want that? Um, then we have the corn grain, the soybean meal, and the corn gluten feed. Now, do we really want that? There are certain instances when we are very short on corn silage, maybe this is a, a good uh, solution. It's not that it's a good solution, but it's many. It, 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 it was. It would not be the first time I'm doing something like this because we ran out of corn silage. Let's put it that way. Okay. And as you can see here, all of the requirements were were met by the software. In the case of the low prices with the low forest diets, we not everything was met. Low and uh, dry matter was a little lower. And in this case, yes, again, all of the triticale was there, no corn silage. And we can see there is a little of alfalfa hay to be included in addition to the uh, some urea, which is pretty much uh, homeopathic. So in conclusion, so far, with low price scenarios, SAF uh, though could be a, an option, is going to, to result in cheaper diets. Uh, in the case of the boot stage, uh, and this happened also with the soft dough, is going to kick out uh, corn silage of the formula. The question is, do we really want that? Maybe if we are short on, on stocks, inventories, maybe that is, that is a good alternative. Now, in the case of soft dough, there is more dependency of alfalfa hay. So you have to evaluate. So now we have the high prices scenario, okay? The commodities. And in this case, with the high forest diet and the boot stage, we can see that pretty much 50% uh, triticale silage, 50% corn silage. We have a uh, ground corn grain, soybean meal, a little of cottonseed meal, and everything is in order to what we wanted. Now, when we put in this high price scenario, high forest diet, the soft dough, yes, we can get a cheaper diet, much cheaper diet, as long as you don't put your triticale in the diet, okay? So is this good? It doesn't look like. So uh, because you need the fiber and you need the protein, uh, alfalfa hay is obligated here at much greater concentrations. Here we have the high prices with the low forage at the boot stage, and we can see uh, some inclusion of triticale and corn silage. Everything looks fine. A little more because of the high prices. A little more inclusion of the of the by co-products, and then when we have the soft dough, we can see that there is again inclusion of the alfalfa hay. So that dependency on on the hay for the protein. So, conclusion so far, with high price scenarios, boot stage would be the, the, the better option, 
okay? Uh, the relatively high con higher concentration of crude protein is going to allow simpler diets, and also the crude, pro crude protein concentration of the soft dough is going to force the inclusion of alfalfa in the formula. So far, we talk about the what, the when to harvest, uh, a few things on the how. Obviously, depending on if you're harvesting on the soft dough, the same concepts of corn silage would be applicable. Uh, in the case of cutting height, if you go higher, you are going to leave more vegetative material in the field, and therefore this uh, high cutting cutting height is going to have a greater concentration of starch and more energy, less fiber. Speaking about the ensiling process, one thing I like this to be very visual. All these species are from this subfamily with within the grasses family. And one thing, one characteristic of these forages is that all of them are hollow. They have a hollow stem, okay? Same as bamboo. They are pretty much uh, parents in this case. So packing is going to be a challenge because of this structure of the, of the stem. Okay, Re imagine yourself trying to press a bunch of plastic straws after you go to, to your, 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 uh, your dinner or whatever. This is a silage uh, uh, picture I took a few months ago in southwest Virginia. They were having very high temperatures in this silage and obviously the packing was not very good. Okay, so again, pack it well and based on my experience also, especially if you use bags, eat them fast, okay, eat them quickly. Here we have, this was wheat in this case, and the, the removal rate was very slow, and you can see how it was the condition that was a mess. One last comment about pH of the silage. Uh, here we have, from that database, we can see the pH, and first of all, we can see that pretty much most of these silages are above four, okay? So it's very hard to obtain the pH silages uh, similar to those that we see in corn or sorghum silages. What is the reason for that? Some people ask about the sugar concentration of these forages. This is a study we, we have done in Virginia uh, a few years ago. And to put some perspective, some corn plants that they have 12% sugars, they had a pH of 3.74. Now, we can see that the pHs in all these silages, five species, are well about four, but still they have a decent concentration of sugars, comparables to those of corn. So I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a sugar concentration issue. I think it's more on the buffer capacity of the forages, okay? Now, in this same study, what we did is we planted the the grasses with uh, either hairy veg or crimson clover. And I will show you the results with the hairy veg. We can see that the pH was even greater, okay? So again, forage quality in, in siling conditions are going to become even more challenging when you add some legumes into your, your mixture. Finally, what to expect? from feeding these silages. Uh, first of all, I don't think there is, uh, I don't know there is a lot of information so far like feeding trials, comparing different species as such. Uh, most of the studies are comparing maybe alfalfa with these species. Um, and some of the information there is saying that milk production can be sustained with the uh, change of alfalfa hay with triticale. Uh, this is a Mexican study, quite of new, big commercial dairy in Mexico, and they observed no response in milk concentration. However, they did observe an increase in milk fat yield by including triticale hay instead of alfalfa hay. Okay, you very well might know that. Uh, milk prices are going to be dependent on fat concentration. So this addition of these silages in, in, in the ration, I think they, they have a good uh, purpose on that regard. In the case of milk protein, there was a linear decrease, but you can see this is 
tiny differences, so not, not much there. We did another study last year in Virginia in which we included also alfalfa hay and what the gra mixed grass hay that we have in Virginia, which I can tell you is not very good. And we did a feeding trial. Yes, you decrease some milk production, okay? But when you put the income or the feed cost by feeding this cheaper, uh, cheaper, cheaper forage, you would be surprised with the results. Hopefully, I will have those results published uh, in the near future. So again, overall conclusions, tree tickle and, and, and rye tend to provide the better forage quality uh, relative to barley, oats, uh, and wheat. Harvesting at the boot stage also is going to help to, to get better quality. Um, soft dough is going to allow you cheaper diets when the commodity prices are low. And harvesting at boot stage will allow you to get cheaper and simpler diets when commodity prices are high. Okay. Uh, and then regarding the effects of harvesting time on production performance, I, I think we need to get more, more data there comparing the different species and the different uh, moments. Before I finish, I want to thank the committee for inviting me here to present. I, I was saying today, it has been 20 years in my, since my first and last visit to Wardery Expo, so I'm very glad to be here. Uh, and I was an intern at that time. Um, I want to thank Mr. Kling Steger from Virginia Tech. He helped me, uh, he provided m uh, a lot of the field data. Uh, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services for, for providing the database and AMTS for providing the use of the Russian formulation software. And with that, I will thank you and entertain any questions. Yes. How, how often do you prefer us grain to ice, the silage, uh, in a store, uh, 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 cow feeding in USA or in Argentina? Okay. So the question is, how often is included uh, these silages in the Russians uh, in the US or in Argentina? More than what you think. Okay, and here, especially in Virginia, they, they, they use it a lot. They do double cropping a lot. And typically, you know that land can be a limitation around here, and they're forced to do this double cropping. And when they, they see that they don't get enough corn silage, they don't have inventory high enough to keep going, they end up, uh, they end up uh, filling the gaps with this type of silage. Same in Argentina. You are from Poland, correct? Ralph. Okay, so Ralph is asking me to comment on the harvesting risk relative to the different species uh, and moments. Uh, let me see if I interpret where you're going. Uh, I go back to the rotation story, okay? So if you have a shorter window, a sp uh, yes, a shorter or smaller window, uh, to do the harvesting and planting your corn, obviously you would like, a sp I would like a species that grows fast, and that would be rye and triticale. Uh, if you have a, a longer window, you I would, I, I would, I like ryegrass. A lot. I think it's a great forage. Uh, but you have to have a, a greater window. You have to go southern. And in that regard also, the boot stage is going to allow you to feed better in that window to grow that corn. If I were your consultant, I always push do corn the best way possible. For that, you need a early maturity uh, winter crop harvested as early as possible. Did, did, did I answer with that?
Okay. Okay, yeah, now I see where you're going. Yes, because it grows faster, uh, you, have, uh, you have to do it faster also, yes. You have less, less opportunities to fail, yes, correct. Are you okay with my accent still? Good. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.